Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Seldman. I'm with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and I am co-moderating with Brenda Platt, also of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, this webinar on uh, <clears throat> bottle bills, container legislation in the United States, with some information coming in from Canada as well. Um, this is one of a series of webinars uh, for the combined uh, Recycling is Infrastructure 2 campaign, as well as the American Recycling Infrastructure, pro uh, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, Program. And the three uh, principal sponsors are uh, the Institute, as mentioned, Zero Waste USA, formerly uh, Grassroots Recycling Network, and the National Recycling Coalition. Um, we will be announcing uh, presently uh, the next webinar, which is coming up in September, and then we will continue uh, this uh, webinar series uh, with the new year in January. Um, at this point, I just want to give a shout out uh, to the folks who have been uh, working on, on this webinar. Uh, uh, Jill uh, Danello uh, from Green Education, uh, Brenda Platt, uh, as I mentioned, Bob uh, Getter from uh, NRC, Gary Liss uh, from uh, uh, Zero Waste USA, and uh, Chloe Seldman from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, it's, uh, I appreciate the support uh, in putting this together. Um, now, I just want to mention uh, briefly who will be speaking. It, uh, we, 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 these are very uh, competent people. I'll give a fuller introduction before each of their presentations, but we do have uh, Chris Berger uh, from the Sierra Club. Uh, we have uh, Clarissa Moraski uh, from Reloop, uh, Elizabeth Balkin from Reloop. Uh, we have Karen McNamara from Conscious Container. And finally, we have Mary Lou uh, Vandeventer uh, from Urban Ore and the British Columbia uh, Bottle Depot and Recycling Association. Um, we're very excited uh, about the presentation. There are going to be more webinars on this subject and related subjects coming in, uh, coming up in the next few months. And uh, we uh, are hopeful that this, uh, these presentations and discussions are informative uh, to, uh, to everyone involved in these very important issues uh, on waste and recycling. Um, having said that, I want to introduce uh, Gary Liss, uh, Zero Waste USA. Gary is also very active in other organizations, certainly the Sierra Club uh, and others. And uh, Gary is going to give us a brief report on the status of the bottle bill in Congress at this point. Uh, and he will also orient us on both the Recycling is Infrastructure 2 campaign and the American Recycling uh, Infrastructure Program. Uh, Gary, uh, please take it away. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Neil. And thank you uh, to our participants. Um, the um, campaign was developed uh, this spring um, trying to uh, uh, build support for uh, the idea that uh, recycling should be part of infrastructure uh, uh, bills pending in Congress. Uh, others have been working on this for uh, ma many years. The uh, uh, campaign was started by the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and Zero Waste USA and uh, National Recycling Coalition joined as uh, part of the steering committee. Uh, to help launch the campaign. Um, one of the things that the National Recycling Coalition contributed was drafting an American Recycling Infrastructure Plan uh, that calls for $16 billion of investment over three years, uh, including fees to cover the cost, fees on landfill and incineration of $20 per ton, fees on uh, non-recyclable and toxic materials, um, also uh, reducing subsidies uh, for uh, um, federal government programs and other ways uh, to fund that $16 billion. Uh, it includes 50 waste reduction, reuse, recycling, and composting initiatives, and it builds on uh, prior uh, plans by the Recycling Partnership, a um, variety of, of folks involved with uh, food loss, um, uh, plastic pollution, and uh, composting, uh, including the Compost Infrastructure Coalition. And the goal of the um, Recycling's Infrastructure 2 campaign was to bring all those different 
advocacy efforts together uh, to uh, have everyone understand each other's uh, positions and to support those positions and uh, uh, overall get the message across in Congress that recycling is infrastructure too and needs uh, an investment on uh, making it um, uh, better for America. One of the components of the uh, American Recycling Infrastructure Plan is uh, support for a national bottle bill. Um, there's two um, uh, particular items, one calling for the National Beverage Container Deposit System with a $100 million investment to launch it uh, with all different types of beverage containers, um, paying, uh, having a, a 10 cent refund uh, or deposit um, with uh, Existing beverage container programs are invited to either continue uh, their state initiatives in the 10 states that have them or join in with a uh, national program. Uh, there's also a recommendation in the American Recycling Infrastructure Plan for a refillable bottle market development grant program uh, for $100 million uh, to create a bottle return system that utilizes uh, refillables and includes a target for minimum amount of refillables. Um, this is a key uh, component uh, that we're really trying to stress uh, following the hierarchy of uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, and reduce and reuse being mo most important uh, before getting into the recycling. Uh, the campaign is asking the network to contact your U.S. Senator and Congressperson uh, to underscore uh, this is important. Uh, recycling is infrastructure too. Support the plan and, uh, and uh, at a minimum include as eligible activities for all infrastructure projects in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, use of reuse systems, recycled content, and compost products. The uh, current um, um, uh, bill in, uh, in Congress, the bipartisan bill that passed Congress, includes $3 billion already for battery recycling, hundreds of millions of dollars for implementing the Save Our Seas program, and other um, education funding for EPA on uh, outreach and education for recycle right and to eliminate contamination. Uh, our campaign has um, uh, sent letters to the president and vice president, um, National Recycling Coalition initiated a petition similar to that on change.org. Uh, we've done a number of news releases on the launch of the campaign in May that has 10 different organizations that uh, agreed to be part of that uh, release. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the American uh, Recycling Infrastructure Plan um, uh, listing is there. Um, we've had a bunch of uh, media coverage on, on the campaign and we've set up a Google group and other links to uh, move forward. Um, if you uh, have any questions, um, you'll be able to contact me and others uh, on this uh, show. I'm now gonna stop uh, sharing my screen and go on to the next presenter, uh, Neil. Uh, uh, thank you, Gary, that, that was a great and uh, thank you for putting up the, uh, the further resources. Um, I forgot to mention at the outset that uh, uh, after the presentations, we will be asking participants to answer a survey. And of course, we'll, we'll check that survey a, a few moments later. Um, on to the presentations. Um, the first person I'm going to call on is, is Chris Berger. Uh, Chris uh, has been uh, very active with the Sierra Club for decades. Um, I can say with confidence that he's part of the Zero Waste Brain Trust. Uh, and has been assertive with his ideas. Uh, he has tremendous experience over the years. Uh, he lives a uh, exemplary zero waste lifestyle. He's also been an elected county official uh, in uh, central New York. And it's a pleasure, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, I'm going to uh, let you know uh, <clears throat> when you have one, you, you have eight minutes. I'm going to let you know when seven minutes is up. I'll, I'll appear on the screen. Go ahead. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Chris, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Neil. It's a pleasure to be here uh, representing the, the Sierra Club. So let's see. OK, so the Sierra Club has been in the space, uh, zero waste, or the waste space for a good long time. Uh, but in uh, 2019, we decided to uh, laser focus into 
in on zero waste. Uh, so we issued, uh, which, which consolidated a lot of uh, previous uh, Sierra Club policies. And since that time, we've been working on uh, what we call guidance documents on a, on a number of the points presented in the zero waste policy. And one of that, those issues uh, has points have been the uh, beverage container guidance. Uh, for zero waste, uh, we've, uh, we recognize the international peer review de definition of zero waste. Uh, no burning, no, no landfilling. Uh, embedded in and kind of guiding the whole thing is uh, products and services put into commerce should be designed to make the return of discarded products for reuse and refill and repair uh, at, and at the end of the life recycle as easy as purchasing new products. And, and you can see how easily a uh, beverage container policies fit right in, in there. So we, we come up with a, a, a number of strategies to, uh, to address that. Uh, and again, right in there is uh, deposit return systems. So the Sierra Club has been uh, pushing bottle bills for nearly 50 years. And again, we wanted to incorporate it in our present policy uh, and, and so very specifically, we support the state and national bottle bills as a vital strategy to increase the collection and reclamation of clean materials for recycling into new materials. It's directly from our zero waste policy. In our guidance, we, uh, we outline the, uh, the benefits of beverage container deposits, highly effective material, uh, recovery rates, high, highly effective in reducing litter, uh, produces high quality materials for feedstock, complements curbside collections and saves money for local governments and saves energy for and reduces greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change. So the, uh, it's very easy to document the, the fact that uh, these bottle bills are the most effective ways of reclaiming, uh, of recovering materials. Uh, just looking at uh, aluminum, which should be uh, a real easy thing to recover because of its value, yet even there we see deposit, uh, deposit container strategies far uh, eclipsing the non-deposit container recovery rates. And the same is true for the, the PET plastic bottles and the, um, and the glass bottles. All along the line, you see greater uh, recovery rates using deposit uh, um, bottle bills. Uh, it's also a great uh, in reducing litter. Uh, this is just a graph that shows as soon as uh, Hawaii introduced its uh, uh, bottle bill, it, it recovered uh, a great deal more. Uh, it, it, it helped the litter, their litter problem. And that's true uh, for all the states that have incorporated those, uh, those strategies. And even in energy use, uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, we focus so much on building use and, and transportation and the like, but in the provision of consumer products, that's where the biggest chunk of our energy goes, and obviously cutting back on stuff yields direct energy savings, but half of that energy use is used to extract and process raw materials. So the more we can recover, uh, we address energy issues as well. And as you can see, actually, if we had 100% uh, uh, recycling and material recovery in our system, built into our system, uh, uh, of using materials, it would be equivalent to like providing all our local transportation without using any energy or providing uh, all of our food without using any energy. So th this is big energy savings if we incorporate these uh, recovery strategies. 
So in the, our guidance, back to our guidance, the, the lessons that uh, we lift up is certainly the higher the deposit, the, the higher the recovering recycling rates and the maximum recycling uh, by maximized recycling by including as many types of beverages and containers as possible in the deposit program. It, it reduces confusion and it just uh, uh, makes the, those, those products, uh, those programs, I'm sorry, uh, more effective. And this is just one example how uh, just by increasing, uh, even if you have a bottle system, uh, beverage container uh, deposit program, the increasing from five cents to 10 cents increased their recovery rates over time as well. So I'm supposed to really concentrate on alternatives that are not recommended. Uh, and, and that is litter taxes with no deposits, recycling uh, laws. You don't want recycling laws in lieu of beverage container deposit programs and Extended producer responsibility. Uh, you have to be careful that they don't uh, interfere with the bottle bills as, as well. Uh, we don't feel that any of these are mutually exclusive, but we don't see any of these as replacement for bottle bills. Just so everybody's on the same page, because I know not everybody supports uh, extended producer responsibility, uh, the Sierra Club does. Uh, we define it as whoever designs or uh, produces a product should take responsibility for minimizing the product's environmental and social impacts throughout all stages of product's uh, life cycle. Uh, it's included in our, in our policy. It, in, in our view, it's really a strategy to engage the producers of products to make them more part of a, the solution rather than part of the problem. Uh, that being said, we're very concerned that there's a good way of uh, EPR, there's a good way to design EPR and there's a bad way. And we wanna make sure bottom line is that any EPR uh, program is not used to uh, to replace or inhibit the development of bottle bills. It simply bottom line, because they are much more effective at, uh, at recovery rates. And we also don't want them to interfere with the growing support of uh, bottle bills uh, throughout the, the various states. And we just don't want the, that to be undermined. And that's it. Chris, perfect timing. Thank you so much. Uh, for the graphics were terrific. Your insights were extremely helpful, and I know uh, we will be discussing them. Um, before I introduce uh, Clarissa, I want to say that we've gotten questions. Yes, this uh, webinar is being recorded, and of course, all the participants, all the participants uh, will be able to get copies. Uh, again, thanks, Chris, and I'm sure we'll be back to you with questions. Um, Clarissa Morosky um, is the co-founder of the Reloop uh, platform. Uh, she's also an accomplished businesswoman, consultant, uh, and she uh, has been following these issues for many years and <clears throat> has uh, over 130 published articles in this field. And it is a pleasure to introduce Clarissa. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Neil, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm just, I've been given eight minutes so now is the countdown. Uh, yes, I, okay, I, will, go. I will appear uh, at seven minutes. Got it, thank you. Okay, so first of all, I think Elizabeth who's coming on after me is probably gonna introduce Reloop as well. So very quickly, um, we are an international not-for-profit organization. Uh, we were registered in 2015 out of Brussels and we bring together stakeholders mm -hmm. under a common vision of a system where resources remain resources. That's effectively our tagline. Um, if you go to, sorry, I'm just having some trouble moving this. If you go to our website, we have an excellent video that sort of goes into 
depth in terms of the five areas that we work in, but we work to accelerate that transition to a circular economy by primarily using research and multi-stakeholder education to drive support of public policy. To achieve lasting change, we uh, focus on five interrelated areas that form the basis for a circular economy, according to um, our theory of change. And here they are. And as I said, please do go to our website and you can learn more about them. So I spend a lot of my time in Europe. And even though I'm a Canadian, I've spent the last six years in Europe working on circular economy. And I wanted to show you this hierarchy. It won't come as a surprise to most of you in the audience. But one of the things that came up over the last few years is the discussion of reuse. And I kept hearing, well, is reuse always better than recycling? And I don't know if reuse is better than recycling when you think of all that hot water and you think of all the transport. So what we did at Reloop was we wanted to get to the bottom of this question. What makes reuse better than recycling? Because certainly at the European Union, they have, again, are settling on that hierarchy and they're not deviating from that hierarchy year over year of regulatory changes. They, they stick with that hierarchy where reuse is above recycling. So what we did was we partnered with Zero Waste Europe we hired some uh, researchers at the University of Utrecht and we pulled together a study that you can get on our website uh, which ultimately did um, it was like a meta-analysis of life cycle assessments and we were trying to understand you know the the answer is often well you know what's better a reusable uh, diaper or a recyclable diaper and the, and the answer is usually well it depends it depends on a number of things and what we wanted to understand was what are those key variables that will determine the environmental impact of a reusable or a single use. And that having that information and being able to communicate it um, in a way that's understandable for many people and policy advisors is a great tool to have to assess the different solutions as they, as they come along and brand owners as well. We came up with four answers. So these are the four key variables that will determine the environmental impact of the packaging, whether it's reusable or single use. The first is obviously transportation. Um, Generally speaking, the heavier, the bigger distance, the more transportation is required. But of course, there are ways of um, reducing those impacts through different modes of transport, decentralized logistic model. We're seeing more electric vehicles, et cetera. But of course, transportation definitely can have an impact. The next one, and it's probably the largest one, is the production of the packaging, the original packaging. From a, a single use perspective, it can be extremely high. From a reusable perspective, every single time you reuse it, you're cutting that production in half. So when we're talking about environmental uh, performance of one package, the production is usually a key piece. Here, for example, is, let's say this is a, a glass bottle and the first uh, bar shows you the total environmental impact of that gloss, glass bottle, inc including transportation, which goes up to the green line. And then you have all the production um, CO2 from that, that one glass bottle. If you reuse it, you're literally cutting that production value in half. So the, the, the two bottles are now half the value. If you do it a third time, you're cutting it even down more. So by the time you get to the ninth rotation of use, you actually those the emissions from the production part is very very small and that's why you know i've heard it said oh we need to reuse things a hundred times that's not at all the standard that we should be going for because that's almost impossible to reach as i said you know here there's everyone is different but here we're looking at you know you're, you're getting a really good profile already at six seven times even though we know in reality a glass bottle in germany for example is going around as much as 50 times the next one is end of life. Well, what happens at the end of life? We know that single use packaging, most of it is ending up in landfill or incinerated. So uh, changing the fate of that end of use to recycling, highest quality recycling closed loop systems can have a major impact on the net environmental impact. And I wanted to end on this key point, which I'm hearing a lot lately is about, you know, what's the difference really between closed loop and, and open loop? when you're recycling it once or twice versus continual? Well, here's the answer. This is from a very recent study out of Europe. I've put a link in the corner, and this is an excellent uh, illustration of the value of closed loop recycling and why keeping the material top 
quality and separated by color, um, by resin, and all of these things are so critically important and eligible for food contact. And here is the difference you get from your classic blue box system where you're getting, let's say, 49 out of every 100 bottles. This is plastic, this example is in plastic. Um, that's probably a little bit high for America, but let's say in Europe, that's what your standard separate collection system would get versus getting nine out of every 10 bottles, 90 out of 100 bottles back through a DRS. Those bottles come in, they're cleaner, then they come back out into the market and another 90 go back. So what you get in the end is this separate collection system is only going to produce 60 new bottles, whereas this one's going to produce three times as much. And the energy benefit from that closed loop is more than triple. This is a summary of those impacts, uh, just so you have an understanding of whenever we're questioning the value of a recycling program or a reuse program, we have to consider these variables because they're all gonna play into the environmental impact. But I was asked to talk about some growing reuse policy trends in Europe. And I wanted to tell you that there is a lot of activity on reuse in Europe right now, both at an EU level, which is kind of the European Union representing 500 mil billion people, um, sorry, 500 million people has sort of uber legislation. And if that's introduced, all the different countries, 27 have to introduce national laws to comply with that uber legislation, sort of like it would be, for example, at a federal level in America. And there's been a lot of political ambition. There's something now called, and you can Google it, Circular Economy Action Plan 2.0, which also has a number of hooks for reuse and refill in it. It includes at an EU level setting targets potentially for reuse uh, for both primary, secondary and tertiary package, but also pot possibly in the grocery sector and the horeca sector, which is hotels, restaurants and bars, as well as transit packaging crates and such. And at a member state level, we're also seeing some individual initiatives not even being pushed by the European Union. And this is being, of course, pushed by uh, local political pushing, consumer interest, uh, NGOs, etc. Here is a list, I'm not going to go through them all, but you can see different uh, national initiatives around restaurant takeout food, making it mandatory for reusable takeout food, making it mandatory that restaurants take back food. In France, looking at uh, really increasing the percentage of refillable bottles, a slew of things happening, and this is just the first, you know, the first round. I'm sure when I show this slide in a couple of years, there'll be many more. One of the biggest pieces of legislation that was introduced uh, back in 2020 is the Single Use Plastics Directive. Article 9 stipulates a 77% collection for recycling target by 2025 and 90% by 2029. These are all plastic beverage bottles up to three liters, including their caps and lids. And the law does not state they must introduce a deposit return system. They also allow them to do it via kind of an EPR program where you've got bins on every street corner and you're collecting as much as you possibly can because that's what you would ultimately have to do to get 90. Um, but what has resulted from it, and I just to show you that they went for 90 because the countries that have deposits in place today listed here have a median rate of about 90 for plastic bottles. So it made sense that that be the target in the law. As a result today, uh, the countries in blue are those that have deposits. The countries in light green are those that are introducing deposits, i.e. they've made a, a legislative uh, change to introduce deposits. In the case of England, they've made a political agreement to introduce deposits. Um, so this is literally in the next three or four years. Uh, some of the key populations that are huge, Turkey has 80 million people, Romania 20 million, England 60 million. And then if you were to ask me, well, who do you think is going to come in the future? Because we have a 90% target in Europe now. I would say you're looking at countries like Poland, which are also quite large, um, France with about 60 million. And I if I had thought about it, I would have put Italy on here because there's been some legislative activity on Italy and deposits as well. Finally, you can see the percent of population that at a global level, because of this huge rise in Europe that are going to have access to deposit return systems is huge. It's gonna increase significantly to over half, um, half a trillion people, um, sorry, half 500 million people. 
And from an EU perspective, from a recycling perspective, we're looking at about 1.6 million metric tons of PET available for recyclers today. By 2029 in 10 years, that's going to double. So from an investment perspective, at least in the PET recycling, this is what I'm talking about now, it's huge. The same, of course, goes for glass and the same, of course, goes for aluminum. But I have these numbers because I did this work. So with that, I think I'm out of time and I'm going to end it uh, if that's OK. Well, thank you. Uh, again, great graphics, great discussion. Let's move right into uh, Elizabeth Balkin, who is also a principal at the Reloop, uh, Reloop platform. Um, Elizabeth has had a distinguished career in the environmental uh, movement, uh, working with NRDC. Um, <clears throat> she's also a professor at NYU uh, in my hometown of New York City. Um, please, Elizabeth, uh, go ahead. Uh, start right now. Great, thank you so much, Neil. I'm trying to get this into full, there we go. Um, I'm gonna skip an introduction of Reloop. I thought Clarissa did uh, an absolutely marvelous job, although um, I encourage you to reach out. Um, my email will be at the end if you'd like to learn more about Reloop Americas. Um, picking up where Clarissa left off, I'm gonna focus a little bit on um, some research that we recently published that looks at the amount of beverage containers wasted annually across the world. Uh, we actually analyzed 93 countries. Um, here's a snapshot of those, um, particularly the ones that we were able to analyze that have systems in place for both uh, deposit return for single use um, containers and those that have some share of refillables um, in their marketplace. And what we found, which you can see is really astonishing by this graphic here, um, the US is not only an outlier in that data set, but an absolutely dramatic one. Um, so while you have um, folks in, um, just one moment, please. Sorry about that. Um, while you've got folks in uh, in much of Western Europe um, that have you know single digit or very low double digit uh, per capita wasted containers, meaning those that are buried, um, burned, or littered, um, the U.S. is up at 422, um, huge amount of waste. So when you talk about is there an opportunity for uh, reducing beverage containers through deposit return, through bringing back refillables? I think the answer, as this graphic shows you, is clearly yes. In terms of reuse, um, for better or worse, Reloop often thinks about things kind of in a wonky way. Um, and obviously, I spent a lot of time in the Department of Sanitation, so I have a particular fondness for operational considerations. Um, and what you see here is basically the interaction of um, refillable bottle deposit um, and single use bottle deposit by using a deposit return system. The infrastructure, the logistics, um, the, the, um, the front, the end user or the uh, user experience in terms of returning at retail or otherwise. Um, and what, the, what this graphic boils down to is to show that if, if you're serious about um, bringing back re refillables, you know, if you want to make this a reality, um, that you must not overlook the importance of having a system, whether it's mostly for, for the user perspective, a lot of this is unseen, um, but that a lot of this can take place um, seamlessly, right? Getting the, getting the bottles back is, is, is only part of it. And it's a big part of it. Um, so for that reason, the user experience has to be optimized. It has to be as easy for a customer um, as going to the supermarket. The customer ideally shouldn't have to focus on whether or not they um, take their reusable bottles one place and their single use bottles to another place. Um, in fact, in a lot of systems in Europe, uh, they, they put the container through the same hole and then what happens, as I said, behind the scenes um, depends on the material of the container and, and where it's going after that. But as you can see, even though there's sort of two very distinct value chains for each of these materials, they are sort of seamlessly interrelated from a user perspective. Um, and in, even in some cases from, from a logistical standpoint. Um, so what we see is that deposit return systems, while especially in the US, um, they tend to focus, be more focused on, um, on single use packaging, 
and single use containers that there is absolutely an, op an opportunity to use DRS uh, to enable and accelerate a transition to refillables. I won't go through all of our policy recommendations, um, but needless to say, as part of the study that I mentioned where we, we looked at 93 countries um, and how much, how uh, the per capita uh, wasted beverage containers annually. Um, and through that analysis, we were able to drill down onto, you know, sort of the key, um, the key necessary components from a policy perspective in promoting refillables, right? And a lot of these, again, have to do with that interaction between the deposit return system and, uh, and the infrastructure and, uh, and operational capacity to, to scale refillables. Um, but uh, there's obviously a lot here more than just um, you know, promoting DRS. It's about creating the right incentive structures for producers or brands um, to, to make refillable something that, um, that they see as desirable. Um, there's obviously an incentive, a role for incentives to play um, for customers. And then again, as I'll start to talk about in a moment, um, the performance standards are absolutely critical. Uh, Clarissa talked a little bit about the, the target um, for 77% and 90%. Uh, return that was established in the single use plastic directive. Um, likewise, we hope to see um, initiatives around refillables or DRS um, that have targets built in there and ambitious targets. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about deposit return systems, switching gears just slightly, um, kind of doing the opposite. Uh, we sort of left off with Clarissa at DRS, and, um, and now I'm going to pick that back up. Um, what, what you see here is a, a pretty informal, non-scientific um, attempt to really look at the systems in place in the U.S. Um, there are 10 states in the U.S. that have deposit return systems. Um, they're all very different. In fact, almost every system in the world is a little bit different. Um, some of the parameters that uh, set them apart are whether they have a, a collection target and what that is. I just spoke about that moments ago. Um, what the minimum deposit, the, the deposit level is, um, whether it's five cents, 10 cents, obviously in parts of Europe, um, it's much higher than that. And there is obviously a correlation we've seen between that and performance. Um, and then speaking to performance, how the systems stack up in terms of uh, the beverages that are covered, the beverage types that are covered, um, as well as the, the recovery rate or the redemption rate, which is the, the sort of system overall return rate, uh, and then broken down here where data was available by material type. Um, so, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of nuance that, that is impossible to capture in this table, um, but suffice to say when you, um, Reloop spends a lot of time analyzing deposit return systems all over the world. And what we see or tend to see um, is that there is uh, a convergence between the high performing systems and certain design elements. Um, we've, we've now taken the step to codify our, what we call these, these principles, these design elements. Um, we bucket them in these three categories, effective and convenient, uh, well-managed and regulated and producer finance. Um, but each of these categories has a set of five or six um, sub-components, sub-design elements um, that we obviously don't have time to go into today, but I'd be happy to um, talk more with you about and share some of our materials if it's of interest. Um, today, I'm going to focus very quickly on the area that I think is most of interest to this uh, today's audience, um, and that is the regulatory and oversight components. Um, again, these are five design elements. Um, each one of these could be further broken out. And with each one of these, um, we have in many cases um, developed several page fact sheets for each of them. Um, so I can't go into that level of detail today, um, but needless to say that um, the components of a, a well-managed and, and a well properly a proper oversight with regards to DRS um, is absolutely critical. Um, as a, I think oftentimes EPR and DRS might be viewed as you're putting producers in charge of a system, governments are losing control. Um, that's simply a kind of a false binary or a false way um, to look at it. It's, it. it's understandable why that would be the impression, but um, there is a lot, there's a huge role for government to play, no matter how involved the producers are, no matter what their level of control or ownership, 
uh, or decision making governance and governance authority is um, there needs to be uh, there's a huge role for government to play in terms of oversight in terms of developing and implementing standards. Um, so this just scratches the surface again I won't go into detail um, too much today. Uh, besides to say that when we are considering legislative proposals around DRS, and there are many at the current uh, time and soon to be potentially some national, uh, a national proposal, um, that again, we, we hope to see legislation that is outcome oriented. And again, the minimum role for government at the, at the state level um, is to, to do the following activities that include setting and enforcing a recycling target, um, including mechanisms to adjust the deposit, right, as, as needed. Um, and that's come up recently in Connecticut and elsewhere. Um, I can talk more about it in Q&A. Um, ensuring that customers have, um, ex have equitable access um, and, ease, and ease of use of the system. Um, that's something that we also see as a role for government to play. Um, setting the penalties at a sufficiently high level that producers are not an incentivized to um basically break the rules and pay the fine right and again it comes down to that delta between how much does compliance versus non-compliance cost them uh, non-compliance in terms of what are the savings uh, operationally if they, if they don't comply but just pay the penalty um, and then finally establishing the responsibilities of government uh, to allow for but also to put governments on the hook to do the kind of auditing oversight and enforcement um, and, and not to um, sound glib here, because as I said, I used to be a civil servant. Um, there's always a question of who pays for unfunded mandates. Um, so to be clear, a lot of these responsibilities have to be established in the DRS or the EPR legislation as being funded by producers, um, which again, there's lots of examples of where that's taking place internationally. I think we'll even hear from other panelists here who can talk about some systems that have worked, some have worked less well, um, but the responsibilities of government are not dispensable. And if the if the question or if the the response to that is, well, where, you know, does government have the capability? Does government have the money? Then I think the answer we feel it comes back to, um, let's get them. Let's get government the capacity they need. Let's get them the funding they need. Um, EPR and DRS, not to conflate the two, but in this case, I think the answer that we find is it's not about reducing the role of government, it's about empowering the role of government to make sure that the intervention that is meant to fix recycling has the desired outcomes um, from, a, from an environmental, economic, and social perspective. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, again, thank you for adding to our excellent presentations. It's certainly appreciate it. And of course, we'll get back to you in Q&A. Um, Karen McNamara uh, is next. She's the principal of Conscious Container, a, uh, a B corporation based in California, but is expanding elsewhere. Uh, Karen, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Neil. Can you see my screen already? Yes, oh, perfect. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, Karen, all right. There also, we go. Go ahead. <laughs> I was on mute. All okay. right. Uh, thank you so much, Neil, and everybody who joined today. Uh, I am Karen McNamara. I am the founder and CEO of Conscious Container. We are redefining the landscape of sustainable packaging here in the United States. And I'm going to start off with just a, a quick introduction uh, of who we are, uh, as many of you may not be familiar. Uh, essentially, Conscious Container is bringing returnable glass bottles back into our U.S. infrastructure and economy. Uh, we incorporated as a California benefit corporation. Uh, we had, have conducted returnable uh, uh, bottle collection pilots. Uh, we are, are working uh, and engaging with regional and global beverage producers. Uh, we are also uh, working um, through innovation and, and, and existing infrastructures, and I'll talk about this a, a little bit further. Uh, we were awarded a landmark uh, Cal Recycle, who's the entity in California who runs the, the DRS, the deposit return system here, uh, a greenhouse gas reuse grant, first one ever, and that is actually in the wine category. 
And we are currently, actually this morning I was working on it, landmark California returnable bottle legislation. And I'll talk a little bit further about that. And where I kind of wanted to start with is that we are all very acutely aware that we have a single use packaging waste challenge that is quite literally unsustainable. And some of the previous presenters have, have talked about all, all the numbers and such, uh, but what we're seeing here is consumers are demanding the change. I mean, 75% of glass goes into landfill here in the United States. Corporations are setting really aggressive sustainability goals that I think we're gonna have some real challenges meeting. Uh, the ESG, financial ESG marketplaces are putting pressure on corporations to be transparent about and really what are you doing uh, to help this unsustainable waste problem as well as our climate change uh, issues. And there's also mandated packaging legislation. It's coming in, it's here, and it is moving forward. And really what's going on is it's time for less talk and more action. And that's exactly what Conscious Container is doing. That's why I started this. It was like, what can we do about it? Not talk about it, but just actually go out and do it. And that's really what we've put in place is, is a returnable bottle system, this circular system that really quite frankly, lowers the environmental and financial impacts um, against single use packaging. So I just wanna talk a little bit about in real basic terms, what a returnable system looks like. And this is what we're, what we're building right now. So, and, I, and it, Elizabeth and, and Clarissa, who we know, I know quite well, uh, already talked a little bit about this, but really just in, in, its, in its short, a producer purchases a, fill, a refillable bottle, they fill the product, they, they sell it in the marketplace. Then what we're looking at is, is we those, those bottles are collected and a returnable bottle is an asset. It is not waste. And so we're working within existing infrastructures. Uh, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that to return that asset where it is washed and it is inspected and it's sold back to the beverage or food producer. And one thing I wanna mention is that I think when we look at, at deposit return systems and all that, what we're looking at at Conscious Container is, you know, the food category. What are all the, we are working very strategically with wineries right now. Wineries are typically not in deposit systems here in the States. I think in a couple they are, but really what are those, um, um, you know, systems within the food industry? How can we get those returnable containers back? So we're looking at it in a really broad scope in regards to what can be a returnable container asset. So I just wanna talk real briefly about what, what's in that system in the infrastructure, which is, you know, Elizabeth talked about, there's different, different ways to look at it. Um, and that's really at the core of what we do. You know, we sell, collect, wash and resell refillable glass bottles. But really what we've got here is, you know, manufacturers and producers need to work with a, a glass bottle that is returnable. They also have to have a wash off label. On the infrastructure side, you know, you, we need reverse collection systems and there's some that are existing and some that are actually being innovated uh, as we currently speak. You need an industrial bottle washer and a, a, an inspector. And then really what we want, and you've already heard the really talk about it, is we want to lean into and be included in uh, bottle bill or EPR systems. You know, those systems need to include uh, returnable refillable containers. So let, let me talk a little bit about what's actually happening here in California. And this is, you know, this is about taking the action. So when we first started setting up our pilots, they said that that returnable bottle had to be crushed after it came from the recycler. And we said, well, that does, that's not gonna work for a system for a returnable bottle. So, so, so we took action, met with Cal Recycle, and they said, well, this is a statutory change. So I took the initiative to work with the recycling commission that's uh, happening right now in California, it's legislated. And then also uh, with Cal Recycle, and we, now, we got a bill on the books, Assembly Bill 962, and really in short, uh, I just wanna talk about what we, what we, um, what's in the bill. And really when you look at it, it's, it's the same process as, as, and this is the deposit return system. It's the same process as single use containers. Uh, the infrastructure is the same. The bottles flow through the same system. Um, there is just gonna be an additional process 
uh, additional consideration in the process for washers because you need to wash that container. And really this was, the legislation was really focused on not crushing the bottles when they came back. And that's the canceling pro process. So, so this bill has gone through the assembly, full bipartisan support. It's gone through the Senate e Environmental uh, Quality Committee, full bipartisan support. We are actually, this morning, we worked on the final amends for appropriations in, in the Senate. And now uh, the next steps uh, will go through appropriations. And we've been working cooperatively with legislation, Cal Recycle. They've gotten conscious container involved also because this is a new system and we're kind of pushing the boundaries. And I think that this is the cooperative effort to, to really make sure that everybody in the, in the stakeholder, all the stakeholders are, are involved. Anheuser-Busch has been supporting this bill and actually got up and made a um, testimony. So really this is about how we work in, in collaboration. And really, I just wanted to talk, talk briefly about what is a returnable bottle success. First and foremost, it's investment. We need corporations and funds to, to step up. Uh, second, there's new models and innovators bringing solutions to market. And you know, I can answer some of these, some give some examples later, uh, but really that are moving um, around and in front of our current industrial complexes. And then really legislation is, is part of this, uh, an important part of it. Uh, where legislation really for the benefit of all. And I think our legislation is speaking to that. And then the last thing I want, the last thing I want to say is the time is now. We don't have any more time to talk about it or conduct any more studies. We've got studies. So it's really about action and engagement and really being transparent and collaboration to take the action that's needed. Um, that's where I'm seeing the success across all the stakeholders in this value chain. And I will leave it there. Thank you, Neil. Karen, another great presentation. Thank you so much. I think we're gonna need two hours for discussion time and we'll, we'll extend it as far as we can, but thank you again. Um, without any further ado, I wanna introduce <clears throat> Mary Lou Vandeventer. Uh, she's a businesswoman, she's an environmental writer. Um, she is the principal uh, with her partner, Dan Knapp at Urban Ore, a, re a materials recycling company that literally came uh, out of, grew out of the landfill. And uh, Mary Lou, besides uh, being with Urban Ore, she is on the board of directors of the Bottle Bill Association, which you'll hear about in British Columbia. And she has a unique position and is able to discuss these important issues. Um, Mary Lou, uh, please take it away. Thank you very much. Um, the first thing I wanna say, um, next slide, I guess, uh, please, Brenda. Um, I am not speaking for the British Columbia Bottle Recycling and Depot Association. I'm on the board. I'm the only American on the board, uh, but the people who are in this organization can't actually speak for themselves because they have contracts with the Monopoly uh, Product Stewardship Organization that uh, the contracts have gag orders. So if they say anything mean or nasty or even just marginally uncomplimentary about the product steward, they are subject to having their contracts canceled. And since the organization is a monopoly organization, having your contract canceled means you must go out of business because there's nobody else you can legally sell your materials to. So um, my position gives me an unusual advantage because I can speak uh, and they can't. And also I, I do wanna point out that of all the people who are presenting on this webinar, I'm the only one representing the actual people who do the work. I have been to many, many uh, organizations. <laughs> I've been to a lot of conferences and heard a lot of discussions and the people who speak the least are the ones doing the work. So um, I'm representing, I, well, I'm observing actually the people who do the work and whose businesses are affected by the many choices that the people on this webinar are going to be making in terms of policy and structure. And I'd love to see more people who do the work involved in the discussions. They were not involved in the discussions in British Columbia. So next slide, please. The, the, British Columbia, the British Columbia has a bottle bill, a very popular bottle bill, 
Consumers love it. They pay point of sale deposits. I, I'm not going to read my slides. Everybody can read my slides and I made them all text, sorry, except for the last three. Uh, and so when you download the slides, you can read through the slides and you can understand most of my points. What I'm really wanting to talk about here is abuse of power and absence of oversight. In British Columbia, we have a, uh, for bottle bills, uh, for, for beverage containers, which will soon expand by the way to milk containers. We have a single uh, monopoly organization, stewardship organization that runs the show. They, they dictate all the ways that people will operate. They dictate how much square footage you need uh, for their chosen bags and when the bags will be collected and how the, how the processing shall go. And they even run, they even have their own uh, software inside the, the operator's uh, POS systems so that they get uh, all the information. Sometimes they don't even turn it over entirely to the people doing the operation. That's how controlling they are. Next slide. And there's no oversight because the Ministry of the Environment says they're over, uh, they're underfunded and understaffed. And they, even though they have a mandate to do the oversight, they don't have the money or staff and they don't want to because uh, their version of EPR, uh, which is different, there's many versions, uh, but their version of EPR uh, renders uh, the bureaucracy, you know, essentially, <laughs> essentially uh, non-functional when it comes to overseeing the uh, industry. And currently the operators of BC BRDA are begging, begging for oversight, some kind of oversight body so that they have somebody to talk to. Um, the stewards currently are incentivized to prefer curbside collection uh, because of how the deposit structure uh, and refunds or return, returning the deposits because of how that system is set up, the financial system. The stewards are incentivized to prefer curbside collection because then they get to keep the deposit money. One of the big questions in setting up bottle bills is who gets to keep the deposits uh, that are not collected? And in British Columbia, it's the stewards. And so they have lots of money to uh, uh, invest and set aside as uh, operating capital for the, for the continuing years. And they have lots of money, but they're starving the operators. Next slide. So what really happens is the stewards quote offer quote uh, a contract every few years. Uh, there's a new offer coming up at the turn of 2022 and it's normally a take it or leave it proposition because you can, you know, officially the operators get to negotiate, but actually that cannot occur because of how the, the steward organization uh, behaves or misbehaves. Uh, and the, the offer normally uh, provides for handling fee. Handling fees are the, uh, the way that the operators are paid for their own work and the steward gets to determine what the handling fees are. They say they're doing cost studies, but they ignore the cost studies uh, that the operators have done. They say they're doing their own, but they uh, select it, their people who they're going to profile, and then they make a profile of what the costs are, and then they offer something less than what their own calculations show are the operating costs. It, the abuse is, uh, it would be very, very long presentation to detail all the abuses of the monopoly. Um, but the way this monopoly operates, they uh, prefer curbside collection without having to return the deposits. They offer handling fees that are lower than the cost of operation. Uh, the steward has developed a method of finding depot operators who will agree to lose money, at least at first. Now, uh, British Columbia Bio Recycling and Depot Association has recently expanded dramatically because the people who were formerly willing to lose money have figured out that really they're just being used. So now <laughs> they've joined, rejoined the BCBRDA, uh, which is, uh, I think, 
just about triple the membership that they were last year. More than half of the depot operators belong to this one organization. And finally, there's some clout. Uh, next slide. So BCBRDA recently put out a letter, a four page letter, analyzing the performance of the stewardship organization that runs the uh, uh, container deposits and recovery system. And the, <laughs> the operators find in their statement, this is a statement uh, and, and letter that was approved by the board of directors. Um, and there's no individual company uh, that can be retaliated against. So the organization now has found that um, in this particular form of EPR, the environmental performance is really lacking. Uh, over 75% of programs uh, targets uh, fail year after year to achieve material specific targets. In, <laughs> for economic integrity, in 2019, the stewards had accumulated $170 million in uh, uh, reserve fund and investments. Uh, next slide. But the final conclusion the operators make, if you read the red print in red, bigger bold print with the yellow background, depots are in danger of going under. I know of one depot that used to, where the recycling operation used to fund a women's shelter some years ago. And now the women's shelter is getting grants to underwrite the operations of the recycling depot. So the table has turned. And in fact, uh, I think a couple of months ago, they, they sold that uh, recycling depot because the recycling depots cannot continue to operate. So next slide, please. And under this EPR system, which has been going for really quite a long time, uh, the, the vertical line shows, uh, uh, to the left of the vertical line is the performance of recovery before the EPR system. And to the right of the line, you see after the EPR system, you can see there's been a good number of years for this uh, system to prove itself and it sure has not done that. Uh, so there's no improvement in the recovery of what are these? These are, uh, this is aluminum and plastic. Uh, beverage containers. So the recovery rate has not changed. Next slide. And for, <laughs> for, for the uh, bag in a box, uh, that's the blue line that's going down. <laughs> that's, they talk about no improvement. They, they've uh, just uh, dwindled. Next slide. And for the overall system, I used the word virtually in front of no improvement because they did go, the, the red line is the legal target, the legislated target that they have to achieve, mandated target. Uh, and that target was being achieved before the EPR system. And after the EPR system, they managed to just nudge up over that target just a little bit for a while, but it's fluctuating and it's going up and down within a very narrow range. So this EPR system um, is being widely touted by EPR activists, but the problem with the information that's provided by the EPR activists and advocates is that the operators cannot counter it in public or haven't been able to until, uh, quite, until now, really. Um, they haven't been able to counter that information because they'll lose their businesses. And so, the message that I bring is that when you set up a centralized, controlled, unregulated monopoly, you're going to get all the abuses that are well known, uh, that are monopoly abuses, and uh, that is just really looking for trouble. And it doesn't improve performance or recovery. It doesn't improve the resource condition of the planet. So uh, that's my report. Uh, from, you. from what advocates call the previous industry. Thank you very much. Mary Lou, thank you for that excellent addition to uh, excellent presentations. Um, before we move forward, I have a note from Gary. Gary wanted to uh, put up on the screen now the dates for the next RIIT, ARIP uh, webinars. Could you do, thank you, Gary. 
Um, I'm going to leave that uh, up uh, for, uh, Gary, please leave that up for a minute. Um, and uh, then uh, right after Gary, uh, we, we take, we write down this information. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Brenda uh, to, um, uh, uh, excuse me, I think Jess, uh, to um, uh, put us on the uh, survey that uh, Gary and I came up with to uh, gauge uh, ish, uh, interest in various aspects of bottle bills. Uh, so Jess, uh, uh, it's 3.04 now. At three, uh, uh, let, let's wait 30 more seconds for people to write these down. Uh, and then um, I will ask Jess to uh, introduce the survey. <clears throat> Neil, I also uh, put these uh, dates in the chat. So oh. if you uh, go oh, to the okay. path, uh, they're listed there. You don't have to jot them down. Uh, Thank but you you, uh, you yeah. should, should jot down recycling infrastructure at googlegroups.com. Uh, that's the new Google group that we're going to be using to try to encourage people to coordinate on the Recycling Infrastructure 2 campaign. Again, thank you, Gary. And let's go right to Jess. Uh, if Jess, you could um, run us through the survey. That would be very good at this point. Sure, Neil. Um, so I just dropped the link to the survey in the chat. Um, and I think it's probably easiest if everyone just takes a minute themselves to click on that link. Um, it's not too long and it's just, um, it's a survey about the bottle bill and what you would like to see included in that. Um, again, that's in the chat. Feel free to take a minute to click on it right now um, and fill it out or you can do it after this meeting. I, okay, it's 3.06 now. I'm going to give people another minute and a half to uh, consider the survey. Uh, and then we are going to open this up for uh, questions, both uh, if you raise your hand, I will uh, try to recognize you. Brenda uh, Platt will be uh, providing questions from the, uh, from the chat and from the Q&A uh, feature of the webinar. Um, uh, the, the, the question should come in on the Q&A feature because it's got more uh, tools oh. to use. So uh, don't pose your questions in the chat. Pose your questions under Q&A. Thank you for that help, Gary. Um, I also want to point out that uh, Taylor Cass Talbot, who's been in our network for quite some time now, uh, pointed out in the, uh, in the chat uh, that uh, there will be a webinar that will focus on um, other things, but including the Oregon uh, uh, status of the Oregon bottle bill. I know that uh, Heather Trim uh, 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 is on this call and we certainly want to address that. And I want to let people know that uh, there will be a webinar uh, coming up on that uh, subject. Uh, Taylor, uh, uh, if you could put that in the chat, that would be helpful how people can tune in to uh, the webinar you're gonna participate in. Um, I just want to mention to people that <clears throat> that uh, Taylor is with uh, Wiego Women in Informal Employment, uh, Globalizing and Mobilizing. Um, okay, uh, Brenda, may I ask you if uh, you have any uh, questions that you think you want to highlight at this point? Yeah, sure. So again, if you want to use the feature to raise your hand, uh, and then uh, Neil can see the hands raised and calling you to unmute. We can do that too. So thanks for using the Q&A box. We've had some at least nine questions already asked and answered by our panelists. So I'm just going to go in order. Um, I think this one would be good for those of you working on refillable systems. So beverage companies object that the old system of refillables depended on thousands of local bottle, bottling plants selling regional products, a model that is no longer viable. Are there studies showing the economic viability of a beverage refill program under current market conditions? I think, Karen, this might be good for you to start off with. And um, um, Elizabeth or Clarissa, if you want to add, we'll go to you next. So absolutely. Hello, Tim. I have a great question. And yes, the old model it went away essentially, right? Because the distances were too long. So the way conscious container is looking at it and, 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 our, and our modeling shows that it can be a viable system. And like I talked about, it's not just, you know, 
beverage containers that are in the beverage system. And this is about setting up the, uh, the infrastructure that moves asset, returnable assets in, in a system. Uh, our bottle washing equipment can, can wash you know, multiple types of bottles. So therefore we can look at multiple categories of businesses uh, or producers, I should say, in the food and bev space. So, and it's about circular, right? It's not about standing up one bottle washer in the middle of the United States. This is about looking at circular, you know, where do the economics and the environmental impacts make sense, right? So how do we set those systems up? We bring in as many producers as possible. So it's about setting up regional, regenerative, circular, returnable systems that tap into existing and innovative uh, marketplaces. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, great, Karen. And I should have said the question was by Tim Goncharoff. I don't hope I'm pronouncing your name right. So Clarissa or Elizabeth, do either of you want to add to that? Nope. Okay. okay. Uh, so um, I think this is a question for you, Elizabeth, from Sandy Childs. Why is there no return rate data by container type in so many states? Isn't this public information? Good question, Sandy. Um, I think the reality is we know that data is a challenge in the waste sector across the board. Um, you know, waste characterization studies are incredibly powerful tools for from an operational standpoint and from a policy making standpoint. Um, and yet we face a dearth of data. There are reporting requirements certainly in, in DRF states um, and yet there are challenges to getting data. Um, so I think, again, this goes back to the point I tried to make earlier about you know, that oversight, um, you know, putting into legislation that reporting is a requirement um, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get good data. Um, there's also issues with self-reported data. Again, that's why, you know, auditing it has plays an important role outside verification uh, is, is, is critical. Um, so do I think that this data is out there? Um, or do I think that there is a way to quantify this data that we don't have, absolutely. Um, so then I think the question then becomes one that's less about um, the, the, the sort of, you know, measurement uh, challenges and more about what's incentivizing or disincentivizing this data from being reported. Um, and a lot of that comes down to what's written, what's, what's a requirement um, and how strongly that requirement is enforced. Uh, thank you. And there's a follow up question related to data, which Elizabeth, you know, or any other any of you could address by Taylor Cast Talbert. Are there any systems with full financial transparency that includes earnings from the sale of materials for recycling? So Elizabeth, we could just go in a circle um, if you want to say anything or. Yeah, I'm going to pass it to Clarissa because I know she's got some thing to yeah, share. So there are there are lots of systems where you can. Uh, look at the annual report, including on the Encorp system. You don't get all the information, but you can certainly learn. Uh, they usually have an income statement, and from that income statement, you can see exactly what producers how what producers financed, how much material sales there were. Sometimes they offer you by material type, as well as any income derived from interest. All of that is in the income statement, which is usually um, verified by a, an auditor and signed off by an auditor. Um, and you just need to look at any of their annual reports and they're usually in the back. In Europe, it's the same thing, except they're often in other languages, but more often than now, they're actually producing them in English as well. Um, it's the first thing that we look at, basically. And Mary Lou, I'm just gonna ask you because I feel like the financial transparency and the transparency, you kind of pulled back the curtain a little bit on this with the British Columbia, did there anything you wanna weigh in on with regarding the importance of financial transparency? Well, financial transparency would remove a lot of the problems, or it would remove it would remove a few of the problems. Um, financial transparency in British Columbia is uh, not anywhere near. It's not. It, it just isn't. There's nothing about the system that's transparent. And Calvin Young, uh, I'm sorry, Calvin Fung, I believe. No, Young. Um, of, 
York University has done some studies on the BC system. And one of his conclusions was he didn't talk to anybody who could describe the whole system accurately with precision. Um, and I have to say that the, uh, the, the reports to operators are not transparent either. Operators are not even allowed into the auditing of their own collection and processing uh, results. So they're, they're not even sure that the results for their own system are accurate. And by combining all these uh, numbers together, you can get an annual report, but there's no, nobody in the world who can say, well, maybe the auditor, uh, but the auditor is not employed by the ministry. So the auditing methods and, and the information that went into the audit are not transparent. So I'm, I'm not sure how to regard even audited uh, information. Neil, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, I wanted to add a, a couple, two things. First, uh, it's uh, Professor uh, Lacan, L-A-K-Lacan. Ah, Yes. L A K H A N Calvin is his first name. He's an economics professor at York University um, in Toronto, I believe. Uh, yes. So just that correction. And Dan Knapp, thanks, Mary Mary Lou's partner, actually summarized twelve of his studies. And I will put that. Uh, I wrote it. There's an article on it, and I will put that in the link in a moment. But I have a question for Mary Lou, and it, it came up when in our early uh, conversations with Zero Waste Canada. Uh, Jamie um, Kaminsky. Kaminsky, yeah. Kaminsky, thank you. And he pointed out that, and I believe you were part of that conversation too, that one of the problems is the accumulation of capital money uh, by the uh, PROs, the, uh, the stewards, um, allows them to lobby the public and lobby government uh, using the mm -hmm. money that they've accumulated uh, to lobby a monopoly lobbying government. And uh, mm -hmm. for those uh, who know the history of monopolies in the United States, uh, which we can go into, uh, Tim Wu, WU has a great book on it. That is the way that virtually all modern monopolies started, using monopoly power to lobby the government cont to continue their, uh, their lobbying, to continue their monopoly. I just wanted mm -hmm. to point that out. And perhaps uh, Mary Lou, if you wanted to make a comment. Well, yes, I would like to make a comment. The, the operators organization whose board I sit on, uh, people should understand that this is not just a club where you pay $25 a year to join. This is, a, this is an organization where operators pay thousands of dollars every year to be members of this organization so that they can get information from each other. And so that building up, um, the number of members, uh, they can also lobby the government uh, if the government will talk to them. Sometimes it's real hard to get an appointment with somebody from the Ministry for the Environment and they, in the conversations, they're short and it's been difficult to, but, but of course the monopoly, yes, has instant access at all times. Thank you, Neil, that's quite correct. That's how it's yeah. operating. Uh, just to let people know, Taylor, uh, Cass Talbot just put in a comment uh, about this issue uh, in the chat uh, if people want to take a look at it. And thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt the questions, Brenda. Please continue. Yeah, no, and because I think for the recording, I don't think people who are listening to the recording afterwards will see that. I'll just uh, read what um, Taylor Cass wrote. Last year, producers hey, made $42 million on unredeemed deposits, which constituted the majority of their budget, according to the report but the PRO is not required to report on income earned from the sale of recyclables. So it seems like they may even have profited from the system last year and there's a link in there. All right, so let's move to some other questions from Kevin Drew, our if, friend in- If I can just add, sorry, oh, Brenda. Sorry, I just oh, go wanted, ahead. Well, yeah, go no, ahead. I just wanted to add to Taylor's really good point. Um, for those, many of you may be aware that um, Connecticut just updated uh, their DRS, their, uh, their bottle bill. And um, one of the changes that was pushed through at the, at the last minute uh, through because of ABA and producer support was um, to actually change it so that the unredeemed deposits now go to producers. Previously, it went to uh, the state of Connecticut. So I mentioned that because I think um, it's a strategy that we could see more of. And, and I think uh, the, the question of unredeemed deposits 
um, as well as uh, how, how uh, handling fees are set, right? It's not just the deposit amount, but also the handling fees that are part of the system. Um, sometimes uh, overlooked or sort of less obvious, but um, are, are really a critical part of the, the financial element um, that, that uh, comes into play with these systems. All right, I see we have some questions more about monopoly and other parts of the waste, uh, the uh, uh, waste infrastructure and system. We're not going to address those today. Maybe we should have another webinar just on that, um, something for us to work on. But let's just get to the questions related to the uh, deposit systems and uh, the um, best in class bottle bill as we're talking about today. So Kevin Drew says, um, uh, can you report on the adoption of, quote, bag drop, unquote, in bottle bill states where consumers bag the returnables using a barcoded ID on a plastic bag and are paid remotely within three to five days? He adds that we are piloting this in California, patterned after Oregon and Maine, who have developed the system. So I don't know who can best address that. Um, Clarissa or Elizabeth, are you familiar with those systems? Yeah. Um, we refer to it at Reloop as kind of white glove service where you can, um, yeah, put your, bag, your, your containers in a bag. Generally speaking, you pay for the bag, so it's not free redemption. And the cost of that is typically a little bit more money than an RVM because you're, you're not doing the compacting, so there's extra logistics, et cetera. But it's certainly an option. Um, we believe that everybody should have the ability to equitably return containers, even if they don't have a smartphone, even if they don't have an account that was set up by the bag drop people, there should always be an opportunity to just get your money back at that time. It's part of kind of our equity principle. Um, but if they wanna have a machine or two and a bag drop in the back, like I think they do in some places in New York, if that's reasonable, if people are willing to pay for it. Anybody else want to weigh in on this question? Seeing none. Mary Lee, I noticed, Mary Lou, did you have your hand? Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say that the uh, the plastic container with a barcode um, on it is going to generate an extra plastic bag. So I don't know how you feel about those plastic bags. I'm not very fond of Good point. All right. There's a question on the British Columbia program. So Mary Lou, this might be best for you, but um, okay. Chris and Elizabeth, maybe you guys as well. Does the BC program include grade 52 cartons? If so, how is that working? Where are the markets? By expanding to milk, will that include only HDP number two or also include grade 52 cartons? This is by J Jeff Donlevy. Yes, I, that was a very good question. Uh, I don't know. I know that milk containers are going to be included uh, starting after, uh, starting early in 2022, I do not know the details of which containers are included. There is discussion about how to handle gable tops, um, and people aren't really sure how they're going to achieve that um, because the, the handling is substantially different from what they're now doing. I don't know about the, uh, the particular resins that are included, so I'd be delighted to find out the answers to that. Um, but I don't know them right now. Okay, so maybe we can follow up on some of these questions. Um, and Heather Trim kind of had a question that's related. Do you think dairy milk should be included? And this could be just in terms of any bottle bill. So Mary Lou, do you wanna, we'll start with you and then see if any of the other panelists wanna weigh in on. We can do this lightning strike, yes or no, panelists. Um, Mary Lou? If you're, gonna, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna do containers, you gotta do them all. I would do think them all. beverage okay. containers. I see Chris nodding. Clarissa. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, I don't want to, there's an expression of poison pill. I don't want to put a poison pill into a program that could capture potentially 90% of all the containers out there. And milk is typically one of those potential poison pills. Um, my approach is I'm not going to, you know, lobby for milk if it's not on the table. The reality is that most of the milk packaging is consumed at home where we have curbside recycling and those containers can typically go in the curbside system. Yes, there's a way from home milk packaging, but not a hell of a lot. So in terms of let's get a program in for the three major uh, material types. 
Um, I think that it's going to be a natural evolution that milk will be added in. They're doing it in Alberta next to British Columbia and they're doing it fine. Even Germany is about to introduce milk. Um, milk packaging is actually very significant in places like France. There's a lot of high density polyethylene. So I think in time, but if it's going to potentially destroy the initiative at a state level, I'd say just don't worry about the milk right now. And over time, it'll start to come in because there is all these uncertainties around the technical side of it. And Neil, before I go to you, just maybe we can just wrap. Taylor Cass has another question that I think is related to adding in other products materials. He says, how about plastic cups and coffee cups in DRS? They are beverage containers. So Clarissa, do you feel, I assume your answer is kind of the same Yep. For that too. I can tell you that I did a, a, a pilot with Tim Hortons in Canada over 10 years ago because it was very much a potential and those machines work and they were all excited about it and it broke down for other reasons. But um, a cup could easily be added to the infrastructure that's in place today. Um, Karen, do you in particular, because you're focused on refillables, do you have any thoughts about these other containers with the refillable lens? So as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's about creating the infrastructure and, and bringing products in to that infrastructure for collection. And, you know, we got to think outside of the beverage, right? In the food category, think about all the food packaging that's in plastic containers. We can move into containers that quite frankly, we can wash peanut butter jars, we can wash olive oil jars, right? So I think, you know, as Clarissa said, you know, making sure that they, they come into the system mindfully. Um, Brenda, and Neil, do you want to say something? And then we'll go to Chris. I want Chris to make his comment, and then I have a question for Chris, if that's okay. Okay, and I'll just mention one thing, since we have five more minutes left, is that I do, there's 24 people who, re who replied to the survey, and I can share my screen if we want to get a snapshot of that as part of this webinar. But Let's, we need to reserve a few minutes for that. I see a thumbs up from Gary. All right, so Chris. Yeah, so uh, a couple things, again, uh, addressing the well what else can we throw into the, the system I, I think it would be important to kind of have a more uniform type of uh, container I think that would help uh, but then also I, I I look at these uh, programs also from the litter standpoint so I'm a I'm a big fan of seeing how much single use containers that are that can so easily just be uh, thrown out when you're on the road to, uh, to, to try to capture those from a litter standpoint. So that's why I said yes to, I'd like to see more being brought into the system, but especially the single use. Uh, 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 and when I say single use, you know, the small containers that uh, you typically see littered around the place. Yeah. So we have a few other questions. I don't think we'll get to everything if you want me to share my screen for just a minute or two, but um, there's just one anonymous attendee mentioned that this Friday, the deadline for comments on uh, the Connecticut bottle bill stewardship conversation, and there's a link in there. So are all these participants making their opinions? No, that would be good. So we won't respond to that. And then Eric Winter asked, um, is there any movement afoot to organize redemption operators nationally? I don't know. Um, I see no. Mary Lou is saying no. So that could be something. Mary Lou, I think you no, might be muted. Not that I know of. Okay. Yeah. So that could be something. So let me, um, Neil, if you don't mind, I will just see if Please. I can do this. Share screen. And. Um, are you guys saying this? Yep. Okay. Um, so I don't know if I can make it bigger. Let's see. Not really. So um, the first question, national state programs, should there be a national bottle bill or should states continue to develop their own systems? Um, again, this is not everybody who was on the call. It's just 25 responses, but it looks like both designed to be complementary with 68%. Unredeemed deposits, should bottlers and distributors keep unredeemed deposits or should unredeemed deposits be reinvested to support container reuse? And it looks like 64% unredeemed deposits should be reinvested to support 
container and only 8%, Mary Lou, your talk was very effective, I might say. Uh, three, inclusive Thank you. Thank you. equity. <laughs> Bottle bills should include opportunities for canners, quotes, workers who make a living on collecting containers with deposits, included income benefits and support for worker enterprises, agree or disagree. Almost 77% agree. Four, container legislation, extended produce APR legislation, should they operate independently from packaging, agree or disagree? It looks like it's more mixed there, but still majority agree. And then on refillable containers, this is probably a little harder to see the results here because it automatically does this. This, in our, this is not our own analysis that I did in the course of this webinar, of course. But basically, it should container legislation require increasing requirements for a certain percentage to be sold in refillables. And it looks like 10% um, going up increasing we may have to like parse that a little bit but just since we have one minute let me just go oversight and transparency looks like 54 uh, percent agree producers must contribute to funder funding beverage container programs by covering the difference in capital 65 percent agree and so forth so i think we're at time and there's some comments there thank you for participating neil is there anything uh, you want to say in concluding Yes, um, we are deeply indebted to the experts uh, who gave us their time. I'm sure uh, we now know how to get in touch with them. I'm sure they'll be responsive to questions. Uh, I want to thank uh, folks who uh, put this together. Um, and um, we will be continuing these discussions. Um, uh, Gary announced the, the next uh, webinars. And uh, we appreciate the participants uh, for your questions and for listening in. Uh, unless there's another word, uh, someone wants to put in the word. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. And thanks for participating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for organizing this.